Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first ever City of Saginaw Government 101. Um, really excited to be here with you guys, and thank you all so much for agreeing to participate. Um, if we could just get started with uh, some introductions, uh, and maybe just say your name, your title, and yeah, how long you've been in that position. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name's Kevin Hayes. Um, I'm just a resident of the city of Saginaw uh, all my life. I'm a student at Michigan State University, a uh, junior majoring in political science pre-law. And I'll pass this over to Cece. Hi, my name is Cecilia Olvera. I was born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan. I am a recent graduate of the University of Michigan Dearborn, Master of Public Administration and Public Policy. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Annie. Go ahead. I'm Annie Bench. I'm one of the city council members. I have been there since 2011, and I've loved every minute of it. I'm Reggie Williams. I'm one of the council members, and I've been there almost a year. Uh, so, and I too am loving almost every minute of it. <laughs> You can go ahead. Amy Lusk, I serve as the city attorney. I've been serving as the city attorney since 2015, but uh, working with the city and the previous city attorney since 2012. I am Tim Morales. I'm the city manager. I uh, started working uh, for the city in 2009. I was uh, the finance director at that time and in 2013, uh, I was appointed interim city manager, and then in 2014, uh, as the city manager. Awesome. And then, Kevin, if you just wanted me to get started with the first topic, uh, we wanted to begin with the city manager and council form of government that we have here in Saginaw. So, if you guys could uh, discuss the role of the city. Okay, so um, as you mentioned, the city of Saginaw is a, a manager council uh, form of government. So the city manager is responsible for uh, running the day to day operations of the city and implementing the policies that are developed by the city council. So, in a, a typical day for the city manager can uh, involve a number of activities from uh, working with uh, the people that provide the safe uh, and treated drinking water for the community or working with the fire chief or the police chief or the city attorney, any of those things that provide the day-to-day -day services uh, to the residents, snow plowing, anything you can think of that is just typical day-to-day -day activity as well as um, policy activities that are initiated by the city council. For instance, if they direct uh, the manager to uh, work on a project or uh, um, promote a project with the state legislature or something like that, or develop ordinances or so on. Um, <clears throat> one of the key responsibilities for us is to make sure that your basic services uh, utilities, sanitation, road maintenance are provided efficiently as possible and um, respond to problems efficiently and effectively for the citizens. And um, just kind of a point, it, the city of Saginaw has had a manager council form of government since the, the charter in the 1930s. and. Currently in the US, 85% of cities that have over 2,500 uh, population are uh, manager council forms of government. Um, and I think uh, you also wanted the role of council. I would uh, turn that to uh, Councilman Williams or Bench if they'd like to comment on that. I was going to the veteran take it. Go ahead, Annie. Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, well, our number one role, I think, as um, city council members is that we we hire and, and, and assess and, um, if need be, you know, fire the city manager. Um, but we also um, 
passed the budget that's developed by the staff and um, we have um, the ability to help write ordinances and shape some of the policies in the city of Saginaw that, that apply to um, and we, we've done vacant property ordinances is one that I've worked on. We've done all sorts of um, ordinances that have originated with the council. Um, it was a change in the burn ban ordinance that was brought forward by like a, our former mayor Floyd clock, I think who worked with the fire department so we could have, you know, small burn, um, you know, uh, fire pits in our backyards and things like that. So it's um, things from, from something as, you know, seemingly insignificant as something like that is to, you know, overseeing the budget. Um, we also get, um, to approve recommendations by the manager, but a lot of the time, you know, we're relying on the expertise of our manager and, and the people that he oversees. Um, but he's our only employee and, uh, we can't go and, and, and as a come on member of council, I only have one vote. So I can't, I can, I can ask the city manager if this, you know, if I have a good idea, is it a good idea? Can we implement this? Can we do things? But I can't tell the manager as an individual member of council, what to do. Um, there has to be consensus on the council. Um, just like I can't go in and, um, you know, tell our, our, you know, police chief what to do or any of the various department heads because they all answered our city manager. So um, it's a checks and balance, you know, kind of system. Um, we're all there kind of, you know, is a last check. And we also represent the citizens um, at, the, at the council table and we're able to listen to them because there's nine of us who represent everyone at large. Um, we're not assigned to a ward system or anything like that. So if, if one person can't get a hold of the mayor, um, they can call the mayor pro tem because we all represent you, um, you know, equally. And so we, we hope to be a voice uh, <clears throat> of the citizens at the table. And I know that a lot of change has been made um, because we have neighborhood associations who have, you know, communicated with the council and brought forward um, different things like that. So I think it's a, I think it's a good system. It's not imperfect, but I think it's definitely um, preferable to the other systems I've seen, you know, in Flint and Detroit and whatnot. So um, that's all. And uh, Councilman Williams, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I did, but she covered it all. <laughs> and then, Annie, would you just briefly um, just talk a little bit about the differences between our system and other systems? Well, like Bay City, for example, and I'm sure like Tim can jump in and tell me, you know, where or correct me because I, I, there's different setups. But in theory, there's the strong mayor and then there's the strong manager. And I think in Bay City, you have a ward system um, where you elect different people to represent different neighborhoods and they really strictly represent only those people, kind of like our um, county commission is set up. Um, they have a they have a county, they have a city commission, I think, in Bay City. Um, they have a city manager that is there as well. Um, and I'm not really sure what that power dynamic is, but places like Flint, um, I think they have a ward system as well, um, unlike us, but they um, run for positions like somebody would specifically run for mayor um, or somebody would specifically run to be the treasurer um, and different things like that. Whereas in Saginaw, we all run for one of the four or five seats that are up for election. And um, we have to then out of the people who are interested in serving in the positions of mayor and mayor pro tem, um, select them amongst ourselves, which I kind of like that because um, it, <sighs> takes away the disincentive. I mean, there's always some competitiveness if more than one person wants to be mayor, but um, you know, it really encourages us to run nice campaigns and run as though we might all end up working together one day and, you know, be, I think, less politicized, especially since we're a nonpartisan office. Um, I know some other local governments also run as partisan offices. I'm not sure which ones, and if they run as Democrats in Flint, I'm sure, um, and I know maybe in Bay City as well, but um, Tim might be able to Correct what, what I'm in at, what I'm not right about there, but um, I hope that kind of answers your question there, Zizi. So the um, uh, councilwoman bench, uh, you know, she did describe uh, the ward system, which we don't have, and that it, that is common in a lot of cities, but that's not what um, was established in Saginaw when they uh, did the charter um, back in the '30s and. Um, so we do have at large members and she's correct a Bay city, I believe has wards and several other cities have wards. Bay city is still a manager council form of government, but they do um, elect their mayor as she mentioned. And there are a number of um, cities that do that. Ann Arbor does that as well. Uh, you actually, the citizens vote for a mayor, someone runs for mayor, but it is uh, like 
Ann Arbor is still a manager council form of government too. So um, they have different setups like that. And then you have the man at the mayor uh, council form of government, which um, we don't have a lot of those in Michigan, uh, Detroit, Flint, Lansing, um, Pontiac. Uh, those are ones that come to mind initially. I think Grand Rapids has a city manager. So it's another large city with a, a city manager as well. Um, but uh, I will um, go back to the role of council too. And um, they are really, they really are the community's decision makers because um, they can promote policy uh, through the city council. And there have been um, initiation, uh, initiatives done like that through council where um, they will direct me or the city attorney to work on an issue. Um, the, um, the marijuana, recreational marijuana ordinance was, was uh, one that was done that way. Council members initiated that, that policy and directed uh, the city attorney uh, and I to work on an ordinance to allow that. So they work on those kind of um, big picture community growth and sustain sustainability issues, um, which allows them to focus on ordinances and local laws and, and policies. So that's kind of, uh, I always think that the, the city council is the policy making uh, body uh, for the city as, as uh, councilman mentioned, they also do adopt the budget. The city charter directs uh, me to uh, present the budget, but they have to adopt it. And um, we do that every spring. So they're the ultimate decision makers. Um, Council uh, member Williams wants to add anything to that. No, I agree. And I, I want to ask this, uh, CC and Kevin, you guys will be taking this information back to select groups or how is, how, how is this working? Because you're getting some great information. I'm just wondering, is it going to be disseminated to um, the public? So I am not sure if that's been 100% officially decided on, but to me it's be on the city YouTube channel, possibly, okay. maybe? Okay. <laughs> Yep, so I'm, I'm recording on here, and if I can get this to Matt, then um, then we'll get it on the YouTube channel. Um, I think this is a good framework, though. You know, these are some uh, good operational questions and topics, and um, hopefully when we can meet in person, uh, maybe we can do some of these at, at either the citywide neighborhood association meeting or individual neighborhood association meetings. Um, that um, that are pretty active, and uh, I've done some presentations at neighborhood association meetings, and sometimes they're just general talk sessions and questions. But maybe with some directed questions like this, we can get more information out. And then the next question, just kind of based off the city council general role, is does city council get paid? Yes, uh, we get paid. Um, I think I just looked at my last stipend and we get paid for the meetings that we show up to is my understanding. Um, so yes, we do. Yes, uh, city council members uh, get a stipend for meetings that they attend. Um, the mayor is compensated at a different rate than other council members. So there is that benefit. Um, that they receive. And um, that's from the city charter. Uh, there's a local officers compensation commission that meets in odd number, odd numbered years to review the compensation of council members. And um, they can uh, make a recommendation back to city council to increase the pay, decrease the pay, or um, keep it the same. And I think we have that we have that coming up this year. They'll be meeting uh, to do that, um, and then council makes um, that decision on uh, the final vote with that. And we um, will be bringing that forward later this year. Um, but with council members, they do get paid that stipend, but um, it's not a lot of money. I think the two council members can tell you uh, what it is and um, they're not 
they're not compensated for additional activities. So for instance, um, going to the census events this past summer to promote uh, the, the uh, citizens completing the census, that wouldn't count in their stipend, but a council meeting would or a committee of the whole meeting um, would. And um, if anyone wants to add anything. If I can, I'll add that um, I think when I got on council, um, the stipend was around $43 and um, that had been put in place back in the 80s and had not changed. And then um, we did have the local compensation committee meet and they made the recommendation for it to go up. Um, and now I think my pay is maybe like $59 and change. And again, if you don't show up to the meeting, you don't get that. Um, and, you know, all of the various committees or initiatives that you take on, like Reggie's not getting paid for this today. Um, <laughs> you know, um, anything like this that you do with the committee you know, or the community when you go to the neighborhood associations, if you attend NAG meetings, anything like that, like Tim said, it's above and beyond, which can can make it difficult because you don't get to like replace your work hours with it. Um, but that's why it's nice that we have nine people who are at large. Um, and if you, you know, work well together as a team, um, you communicate with each other. And if the mayor can't be at something and the mayor pro tem, they always, you know, try to encourage us to show up to different things and make sure that you know, one way or the other, one of the nine of us is aware of, you know, or participating in the various things going on in the community. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it's unfair though. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's fair. Um, and I, I think the best way to describe it was um, our, our former council member, um, Larry Kaluris always referred to us as elected volunteers. Um, because you really could make, you know, 25, 30 hours of work out of out of things that you could do for the community between the, the calls that you get from citizens and um, just different things that you can involve yourselves in or invitations. I mean, we get invitations to things all the time um, that hopefully like at least one of us can attend. But, um, you know, you could make a, a part time job out of this. So, I mean, it really depends on the individual, what they're able to do and what they are willing to put in. But. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that can be done outside of the council meetings. And then this next question, um, if the uh, city attorney would like to is who writes the and how has it changed? Sure, I can address that if the city manager would like. So a general revision of the charter uh, may be initiated by either a three-fifths vote of the city council or by a citizen initiatory petition. So at the, not in the 2020 election, but I believe in a couple of the elections, both midterm and uh, presidential elections in the prior years, we did have amendments to the charter uh, on the ballot, and those were initiated by council action. So a three-fifths vote of council would have been taken to initiate that process. And then uh, there are several steps that would have uh, gone between that and the election uh, to bring that forward and get it on the ballot. Uh, if it's raised by initiatory petition, that question then would go to the voters in the city of Saginaw and they would make a decision as to whether or not there needed to be a general revision of the charter. If that's approved, then the voters elect a charter commission and that charter commission is charged with drafting a charter revision for consideration again, which would go back to the electors in the entire city. It's a process that's entirely governed by the home rule city act so state law governs the process awesome thank you um cc is gonna have to get going soon so i uh i'm going to take over from here okay um so i'll direct this question to uh tim uh what are the city departments and what are the basic responsibilities of each of them? So we have a lot of departments in the city because we, we provide a, ver a variable number of services. So really the best um, place to check that out is the city's website. 
and that's um, saginaw-mi.com. So you can go on there and if you put, you can pull up every department that we have and it gives a description of a general description of the department and what they do. And then each division within the department also has a section on the website and it'll just give you a description of what uh, they do as well. Uh, and these are the categories that we have. And I, I didn't put it in my notes because we have so many departments, but we for general, the overview of the um, departments are community and economic development. And that is where we would have inspections and scenic and code enforcement, um, community public, or I'm sorry, uh, let me back up. Uh, those, de that department kind of splits two different categories. So planning and, and zoning and um, block rent, that would be in community and economic development. Community public safety would be fire, police and inspections and code enforcement. And then we have fiscal services, which has um, treasury, water billing, income tax, purchasing, accounts payable, um, payroll, assessing. Um, so you can see most of these departments have several divisions that do that have various duties. Human resources is a separate department. Office of Management and Budget, they uh, prepare the budget and they, um, they also um, oversee our grants. Public services would be snow plowing and um, streets and road maintenance, cemeteries, parks, um, et cetera. Technical services, which is our GIS department and our IT department. Uh, wastewater, water and wastewater treatment services um, would oversee our water treatment plant, our wastewater plant, and our infrastructure distribution system for water and wastewater. The city manager is another department. The city clerk is a general government department, and city council is listed as a department. So um, generally, uh, those departments are, are pretty well depicted by the title, but you can uh, check out on the website and see the duties within each one and see all, all of the breakdown for all of the divisions. I think real quick, quick like to ask Tim a question. Um, with all of those departments and all of those different services that we provide, um, how many employees do we have citywide? We have over 450 employees and it fluctuates. Um, it can be up to 500 with seasonal and temporary employees as well. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty large operation. Um, over the years, it has, it has decreased. And I, I, I'm sure that um, uh, Council Member Williams could tell you because uh, he previously worked for the city, but we did have even more employees. Right now we have um, we have actually twice as many retirees, I think, as we have employees, because we have close to 800 retirees uh, now that um, we're providing uh, retiree benefits to. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to segue into talking about the uh, city budget and the tax caps. Um, so with that being said, uh, would anybody like to explain what is the general fund? I'd like to explain that. <laughs> so uh, the general fund is the city's main operating fund. So it pays for core community services, uh, such as the police department, fire department, scenic, parks, planning and development, and other vital uh, support systems, which would be like human resources and accounting and et cetera. So that's your, you think of like your general services departments. And that budget is um, around $34 million a year. Um, just as a note, um, CC had to leave the meeting early and I believe that um, council member Williams also has to step out. So we thank both of them for uh, attending and uh, we'll continue uh, the meeting with uh, Kevin and uh, Councilwoman Bench. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to continue off of the general fund question? Um, 
Do we have a, a cap on our general fund? Yeah. You're muted. And I said, what was that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did uh, you were starting to say we had a cap? Yes. Did you want? Would you? It's best if you do it probably between the two of us. Um, but would you? Would you touch on the cap, the the tax caps, and how that affects? Sure. Yeah, I'll walk through a couple of them. A couple of the issues, and I know um, that that were of interest. So, we had the general fund that I just mentioned, um, which are basically the general services, and we also have enterprise funds in the city. So, enterprise funds are used by government entities to account for services provided to the general public on a user charge basis. So, some examples uh, in the city of Saginaw are the boat launch operation fund sewer operations and maintenance, water operations and maintenance. And um, regarding the general fund, uh, so separating those two, those are all service fee based um, funds. So none of the money for water and sewer and streets and things like that come uh, from the general fund. Um, streets isn't an enterprise fund, but um, that's a separate kind of fund as well. So the general fund is operated through our income tax and our property taxes. And as, as you mentioned, uh, Kevin and, and Councilman Bench, both we have a tax cap in the city of Saginaw that was um, put in place in 1979 by a vote of the people. And the tax cap limits the amount of property tax that the city can receive. And that limit is uh, seven and a half mils or $3.8 million, whichever is lower. And um, the 3.8 million, I believe, is the amount of uh, property taxes that they collected in the previous year. So they set that as the cap. So um, that's been our max for, uh, for 40 plus years now for property taxes. And um, it does limit what we can collect. Typically, we're not at the seven and a half mils, nor are we at the total $3.8 million for various reasons. Um, but um, that's what the city of Saginaw has learned to live with over the years. Um, I always do um, say that um, we have had various attempts to lift the tax cap, and, but I always do mention that even lifting the tax cap isn't isn't an immediate um, relief to the city, you know, and a lot of people either have that hope or have that fear where if there wasn't a tax cap, automatically taxes are going to severely increase, which um, would not be the case. Um, if, it's, if the tax cap were ever lifted, it would be a long term, um, I guess, solution if, if, that, if someone was looking for that, it'd be a long term impact on the city but it would not be anything immediate either way. Um, so uh, I know uh, Councilman uh, Bench has worked on those various initiatives and uh, if she wants to add anything about the cap or, um, or the general fund and let her comment. Um, I recall, you know, it was probably before um, Tim was city manager, but I believe the, the mayor at the time, Greg Branch, had asked um, the city staff to get us some some figures. And this was, of course, after we had the, the housing bubble burst and we saw so many foreclosures and, um, you know, we're really in a housing crisis in a lot of ways. Um, excuse me. Sorry. Um, but uh, I, I believe at the time um, we had gotten, it was maybe around $100,000 at the time. I think it was 2012. Um, if we had lifted the tax cap, that would be the like maximum amount of revenue. But um, I'm not 100% sure on the number, but I, I do remember that uh, we were told in order to get to the pre-housing bubble collapse, like numbers of revenue, um, if we lifted the tax cap to get back to that revenue that we were at just receiving before the housing bubble um, burst, it would take probably 30 years. 
um, for us to get there with with Prop A and the Headley Amendment and the way state law governs our ability to um, raise the property taxes. So on the one hand, um, it's not a magic bullet solution, um, but the very thing that I think keeps people and the public from from voting for it, um, it's a double edged sword. It's a hard sell in that respect because you can't necessarily promise um, immediate change in results. Um, but at the same time that, you know, doesn't go very far to reassure people at the same time that you're not going to um, raise their rates, you know, in an exorbitant fashion, um, you know, too quickly. So, um, but it's something I think that has to be done. I think that probably everybody who's ever joined this council, whether they came on um, knowing or understanding the issue have come to realize that it's, it continues to be a serious detriment and it's going to be a detriment to um, the next generation of council members and, and, and city residents, I think. So um, that, that's my opinion, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tim, you had mentioned um, enterprise funds. Could you expand on those a little bit more and what they are? Sure, so enterprise funds operate um, as I mentioned, as on a user fee basis, a charge. So they operate like a business. So kind of like a business, I would describe it, but um, they're not concerned with profit. So whatever the service costs to uh, produce, then that is what the charge will be. So um, our biggest uh, enterprise funds would be the water fund and the sewer fund. Um, so basically, um, when you look at those funds, they need to be um, producing enough revenue to pay for the purchase of the water, the water treatment, uh, including the employees that are there and the legacy costs that are there and the infrastructure and the water plant. Um, and also, they need to be able to um, either build up a cushion for um, incidental repairs or emergency repairs and also plan for long-term uh, upgrades to the system. So that's all part of that process of building up that user fee for that specific service. Some of them are easier. I mentioned the boat launch. Um, until recently, that was, uh, you know, kind of a fee that, that council set that um, was an open lot and you paid to park, but um, we wanted to make sure that we did have money um, for maintenance over there and for repairs if necessary. So um, we tightened that up a little bit as an enterprise fund and we did put um, an entrance gate so every to make sure everybody pays, which is an assurance we need to, to provide to council so that when the lot needs to be repaved, there's money in that fund to do that or when you have to rebuild the boat, the actual boat launch that the, the um, people back their boats up on to get on the river so that council and the public can be assured that um, that, that money is there to continue the service and also that um, you're not subsidizing it with your tax dollars. So maybe um, you're fine with the city having a boat launch, but you don't have a boat and you don't fish, so you don't want to necessarily pay for it with your taxes or your property taxes or income taxes. So you can be assured that you could look at the audit and say, okay, well, the city has a boat launch and it's $100,000 to operate and they're bringing in $100,000. So you're assured that um, it's not being subsidized. Not to say that, that that never is subsidized in some cities because sometimes there can be a shortfall and you do have to cover that. In that case, you, um, it's incumbent upon uh, management to look at those accounts and funds and make sure that they are paying for themselves. And if not, uh, get recommendations from the controller and the auditors, and maybe you have to change a fund um, so that it's no longer an enterprise fund. And then it, it would switch over to the general fund. And I believe um, my council uh, woman bench may remember, but I believe cemeteries used to be an enterprise fund in the city and it is in some cities. Um, but uh, when you have a annual subsidy that becomes so great, you, you have to realize that it's not functioning like an enterprise fund. So that is cemeteries is in the general fund now. So that's kind of a way of, of a separation of how you pay for the items 
and also you you do need to continually review those um, those funds to make sure that you are meeting your expenses. Thank you. Um, I'll open this question up to everybody. Um, anyone who wants to answer? Uh, could someone please discuss Saginaw's historic loss of funds via revenue sharing? I can uh, talk about that if you'd like. So um, revenue sharing is our second largest source of revenue in the city. Um, our largest source of revenue is um, income tax and second is state shared revenue and third is our property tax, which is it's pretty far behind um, those other two. So state shared revenue, um, it does vary and um, we have had significant decreases in the past and I don't tie it uh, to to politics or any political party or another. We've had decreases in revenue sharing under both parties of the governor. Um, the issue becomes, um, and, and we've had governors that do it different ways. Uh, a previous governor that we had, um, so each year the state sets your constitutional and statutory revenue sharing amounts, and we prepare our budget based on those estimates. So we're counting on that money to come in to live within our general fund budget. Um, under one governor previously, that would get changed prior to our year end. So we would have to make adjustments during the year for those reductions from the state of Michigan. The future governor made a pretty significant cut at the beginning of, of uh, his term in office. However, annually increased the payment and I don't think we've seen decreases since uh, probably in the last 12 years. I think it's been um, pretty stable or slight increases. Uh, the issue becomes when you look at these decreases we've had over the years, it's great when it comes back up, the estimates come back up and the state provides us that money. However, we're operating from behind anyway because we've had several million dollars cut. Um, state shared revenue is uh, from taxes that they collect statewide and it is allocated. It's uh, a, a pretty complicated formula and it's tough to get anyone at the state to explain the formula to you <laughs> if you ask them. So, um, but I, we do know that population is a factor in that formula for state shared revenue and gas and weight tax allocation. So if our population goes down, that's going to decrease our state shared revenue and our gas and weight taxes, which is the source of revenue we have for our streets. Um, so that makes um, all the reasons that the mayor and the councilwoman bench and all the other council members uh, put a focus on the census this year. That's just another reason. Now, I know we talked a lot about block grant money and federal dollars and grants, but our um, gas and weight streets money and our revenue sharing all tie back to that as well. So um, it's a pretty complex issue, but I'll tell you that we're, um, we're always fighting for uh, revenue sharing increases and the Michigan Municipal League is always advocating for that as well. And um, we're not going to stop doing that. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to move forward into some uh, just general frequently asked questions um, regarding the city. Um, so one I'll start with is why aren't city employees required to live in the city? I will ask the city attorney to uh, respond to that question. Uh, sure. The short answer is that if the city were to impose such a requirement, it would be unlawful. Uh, there is a historic body of case law, both out of the Michigan Supreme Court and Court of Appeals um, that have knocked down uh, requirements imposed by cities and other jurisdictions requiring that employees live within their borders. And then the state legislature actually codified that in 1999 
uh, indicating that with very limited exception, it would be unlawful to impose, impose a residency requirement on employees. Makes sense. <laughs> um, next question, uh, why does it seem like our water costs more in the city? Um, I think this is a good question, and I like I like the way that it's phrased, Kevin, because I noted the seems like um, because it's our water isn't really more expensive on a comparative basis. Um, the water systems are are fully owned by the communities, and the cost of the water is directly related to the cost to operate the systems. So the city of Saginaw's water system is much larger and older than those directly surrounding us, a lot of the townships. So we do have um, costs higher than what they have just because the size of our system and the age of the system. Um, so I think sometimes um, people tend to compare our rates with those immediately surrounding us. So maybe they compare the city of Saginaw's rate to Saginaw Township's rate, which um, I think is probably the most common thing that you hear and see. Um, but in August of 2019, the city's rate consultant did a presentation to city council for the financial plan and the proposed rate to begin in 2020 for the city of Saginaw's water system. So in that, uh, in that presentation was a comparative study for a residential size meter, which is a 5 8 uh, meter, and 6,000 uh, gallons of water usage, which is a, a kind of a typical average for a family of uh, four, three to four people, I would guess. And out of the eight cities, Saginaw's existing rate in 2019 was in the middle of the pack. So we placed uh, lower than Midland, Lansing, Bay City, and Flint. Um, so our rate was was quite a bit lower than a few of those. And then with the proposed 2020 rate compared to the 2019 rate of the other cities, um, we were still towards the middle with Lansing, Bay City, and Flint still having significantly higher rate than the city of Saginaw had. So when you look at those comparative cities um, to age for the city and, and potential size of the system, um, our water isn't. It is usually less, um, if not comparative in our rates, uh, but we do have to think about now the lead and copper rules that were instituted by the state of Michigan. That creates an additional charge on our water bill, which um, you've probably seen on your bill because we did indicate that in the line item because it's a state requirement. But that's going to make it look uh, even a, a little more different because with the exception of Bay City, I don't think any other system in the region is old enough to have lead and copper uh, components in it. So Saginaw and Bay City will be replacing a lot of these lines. I think we probably have 16,000 lines or around 15 or 16,000 of those uh, lines to replace. And that's a significant cost. I don't know how many Bay City has, but they're a system similar to ours. So that's going to be a cost for them as well. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, Lansing rates were probably in that higher end is they did that replacement a few years ago and bonded for it. So um, they had that expense. Now, for thinking about those water and wastewater bills, a big component of that is the uh, wastewater or sewer part of the bill. So in that total bill that you're getting for your home, you have the wastewater bill too, and that is is quite a bit higher than the water bill. And the reason behind that is that uh, it's probably been a little over 20 years ago now, the state of Michigan uh, required system changes for the city of Saginaw to create a combined uh, sewer overflow, CSO and retention basin, basins um, close to the river. And that was a project that was, I believe around $120 million. So the city was required to bond for that and that bond payment has been in that 
um, sewer charge for the last 20 years. And that's a significant amount of debt uh, to, to incur at a single time. So for instance, we just had a major project in the water system. Uh, we call it the Davis Road Project, but it was one of our transmission lines. So that's a significant line that we're doing. Um, and that was, wasn't even 20% of that cost that we had there. Um, so that was a huge project and it's just now being paid off the debt. It might've have, might have even been paid off last year. But what that's caused in our wastewater system is we've been deferring maintenance and larger projects because we didn't want to add to that rate because we do believe you know it's it's a high rate so right now um, we are working on a wastewater sewer um, development plan a replacement plan upgrades and um, that'll be presented to council probably within the next year and that will have a um, uh, wastewater rate study. Our goal is not to have to increase it much, um, but we do know that we we do have to have some upgrades there as well. But um, we're always looking at new ways to try to keep that down and um, and provide the best services that we can um, in both water and wastewater. If I may. Um, I would just add that um, I've had similar questions posed to me about our rubbish bill. Um, and I know that our uh, public services director at probably more than one time over the last several years has provided us a breakdown of our rubbish services that are provided. And it really breaks down to a fairly minimal charge per week. I think the rate is 225. And if you divide that by 52, um, and when you look at the services that we're providing, whether it's, um, you know, yard waste pickup or recycling, um, what you're what you're getting the services that you're able to utilize for the fee um, is is actually fairly fair and equitable and when you compare it to other communities it's not always accurate because they may not provide you know their, their fee might be less but they also may provide less services so um, and I know that shortly before I joined council that fee in particular was a $50 flat rate per year plus a, a millage which I don't remember the rate like I said it was before I got to council but there was a, a millage that was applied so it wasn't to be honest i ran not really like liking the change but after i got on council and learned some things i changed my mind and <laughs> realized that it was probably it was definitely the best decision uh, made at the time um and you know it turns out when you run you learn a lot you know and get on and you learn a lot of things and you can change your mind about a lot of the stuff that you don't know in the first place but um that was one for me and so now we have a flat rate that everybody pays the same fee um, I know that there was like a double fee basically that was being charged to business owners because they didn't get to take advantage of the trash service, but they were being, you know, that, that let, millage was still levied to them, um, but they had to provide their own dumpster services and things like that. So um, that was a change that was made to be more equitable. And, um, you know, one of the first things I voted on at council was to bring back the service. I think it was our very first meeting after we got elected was um, to bring back recycling into the city of Saginaw. And I think at the time um, it was advantageous to recycle because we were getting paid more to haul away the trash because basically when you recycle it, it has to do with the value of what, of the materials that you're recycling. So there are some times where recycling um, and having a high participation rate would actually benefit us and help maybe bring those rates down in the long term. There are other times, depending upon like I don't e economics that I don't really understand. Um, the 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 fee to recycle ends up actually costing us more than than it might be worth. But obviously, we want to provide that service because we care about our our planet and our city. Um, so you know that has has to do with that. And then you have delinquent people who don't always pay, um, and and the services are still provided to them when it comes to rubbish. Um, we can't stop picking up your trash because. Uh, we have a contract, uh, you know, a separate contract. Whereas, if you don't pay your water bill, it does get shut off, and unfortunately, um, you know, people have a fee that they have to pay to get it restarted. So, um, it all really comes down to just trying to provide the services and do it in a way that is, you know, cost effective, but obviously doesn't exceed. Um, you know, we can't charge more for trash and then use that excess, or charge more for water and use that excess for anything else. It has to go back into providing the service. And like Tim said, it was all fee based, so it has to reflect the cost of the service that you're actually providing. So um, that's all. And I will also add that um, we, it's difficult to compare the city of Saginaw with 
some of our surrounding communities because we do we, we are uh um i'll say older city in that we've provided services for far longer than than a lot of the surrounding communities so we have what's called legacy costs which are pension costs and um other post employment benefits costs which would be retiree health care um so those costs that we have to provide for those employees who used to serve the city are part of our fees, whereby um, some other communities that have grown a lot in the last 20, 25 years are, um, they don't have that similar cost right now. So really when we, when we compare our services, we do try to look at um, other cities like in our region, it would be more like more like Bay City. We would look at Flint. We would look at Detroit, Lansing, Grand Rapids, um, some of the cities that have been um, providing services for the same length of time as us for comparative purposes. Um, but as as Councilman Bench mentioned, and I know our city attorney would comment, we don't use that to set our fees because um, we need to only recoup our costs with those fees. So we, we need to charge what it costs to provide the service. Thank you. Uh, I like that information a lot. Uh, growing up, that's all I've heard my grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles talk about is paying their rubbish bill and the water and complaining about it. Uh, as if there's no justification behind it, but I'm glad to hear that there, where there's a rhyme, there's a reason. Um, so the last question that I'd like to pose to you all is uh, a two part question. Um, some cities don't have an income tax. Uh, why do we, and how much revenue do we get from property taxes versus income tax? So, um, the city attorney did, uh, she provided the statute, um, but Mi Michigan cities are allowed under state law to have income tax, uh, but it has to be voted in by the, the uh, voters in the city, the electors in the city have to vote for it. So um, years ago, the city residents voted uh, to have an income tax. And I can imagine that um, it is related to that property tax cap in some in some way where um, they'll pay this and and as long as they have a limited property tax cap or vice versa. So um, there are several cities in Michigan that do have an income tax, and a lot of them are are the legacy or urban core cities like Saginaw, Lansing has one, Detroit, Pontiac, uh, Grand Rapids and several smaller cities also have income tax. Um, Ionia has an income tax, and I would uh, care to wager that several other cities wish that they <laughs> did have an income tax. Um, but just like uh, when you put things on the ballot related to the tax cap, they may, they may not be a popular issue like Councilman Bench mentioned. Income tax uh, in the last several years probably hasn't been a very popular issue to vote on. Um, for most communities. Now, the city of Saginaw, income tax revenue in 2020 in our audit, it shows a $13.78 million in income tax revenue. And our property tax revenue in 2020 was $3.6 million. So there's a, a pretty significant gap. And, and I mentioned earlier that the tax cap was 3.8 million, but we usually don't collect that. And, and Councilman Bench mentioned a few reasons, Headley and Proposal A. And um, we also have some other um, zones that are exempt from it that have been put in place years ago for development. And most of those are expiring, but all of those impacts the amount we collect. So we're not collecting the 3.8 million. We're not at seven and a half mills. We're at 3.6 million uh, for property tax and 13. Point seven, eight million for income tax. Uh, and I wanted to uh, pull the other numbers for you, Kevin. So uh, for your reference, uh, 2020 state shared revenue was 8.01 million. So by far our, our, our second uh, behind income tax. Um, grants, donations, and contributions, which are primarily grants, were $4 million in our general fund. So that was more than the property tax that we collected. Um, 
And then license permits and fees within the general fund was $2.7 million for a total general fund revenue of 34.1 million. So that income tax and state shared revenue, those two are uh, two of the most important sources of revenue uh, for the city general fund. And uh, I don't know, Annie or Amy, did you wanna add anything? I would just quickly add that um, if I counted right, I, I think there's a total of 24 cities in the state of Michigan who do charge an income tax. Um, and I would note that villages are not allowed to charge an income tax. So while it, while it might seem that um, charging an income tax is few and far between because some of your neighbors might not, they, they might be a different form of government. They might be a village or a township instead of a city. So they might not have the same ability. Um, the other thing I would point out is with the income taxes that city can charge, it's not only an income tax on city residents only, it's also charged on anybody who works within the city. So um, non-residents who work within the jurisdiction are also um, required to pay income tax as well. A really good point, Amy, because um, I think a lot of uh, city residents across the state of Michigan would would see that where you have your city and you're a resident, but you see people coming in and working and then receiving, essentially receiving benefits and fire and police protection and so forth, but then they leave. So that income tax on non-residents helps to pay for those services that they're receiving um, that they normally would not pay for through um, through property taxes and that, as Amy mentioned, uh, that around 22 dozen cities in Michigan that do that, I think that that's probably the driving force that that um, did uh, behind uh, what allowed the residents to vote for that income tax to put it in place. If I may add, just to clarify, um, you know, one example I've heard, you know, used when explaining our, our tax situation is, you know, if a company like Google were to come in and develop a, like, seven, several million dollar, um, you know, structure in the city of Saginaw, unless they were developing, like, an obsolete property or something like that, where, where that might affect what kind of um, tax incentives are available, but the real benefit for us as a city would not necessarily be in the property tax value of that $20 million structure. It would really be in the um, employees that were then hired, whether they lived here or not, to work there. And obviously, creating jobs within the city is always, you know, something that we want to see happen. But a lot of the time, the, the focus on development necessar isn't necessarily um, because we're going to see a huge, um, you know, re increase in, in property tax revenues because of the cap. Correct. Um, it would be from creating those jobs, which is why over the years the city has advocated so strongly for. Um, you know, uh, our unemployment office to remain downtown and jobs uh, with AT&T to remain downtown because um, or why we felt such an impact from from different closures of different companies. And I'm the one over on the east side that I'm not thinking of that just closed within the last couple of years. Um, we saw, you know, I think it was like a I'll let Tim give the numbers because I won't remember them right. But, I mean, we saw a projected loss in, in uh, revenue because we were losing those jobs, not so much because of the structure. Um, because of our tax cap, but because of the, the actual jobs. Is that, am I somewhat, somewhat right there, Tim? Yep, uh, TRW was probably the company that you're thinking of. So, um, it, it, and uh, Councilman Bench is correct. We, that's why our, a lot of our economic development focus is on job creation um, twofold, because uh, we want our residents to, to get jobs and also, um, the uh, income tax is our primary source of revenue. And um, we've seen such a decline in manufacturing industrial activity in the city. And even beyond Google, I, I, I tend to use the, um, the GM reference where if they put a new plant in the city, that was a $200 million plant, um, where we're gonna get the, the revenue is from the jobs that are created there. Um, I will say that uh, we do, when, a company like uh, a large manufacturing company may leave. 
we do projections on income tax and that's our primary would be our, our our primary concern for revenue loss of course we're still concerned with we don't want blighted properties we don't want vacant properties sitting around particularly industrial properties that um, may be abandoned um, but we look at that income tax amount and um, i've been uh, rather i think pleasantly surprised over the years because uh, with the council and partnership and our economic development uh, group um, in the city Saginaw future and and some of our other partners, I think um, Saginaw has done a good job at replacing uh, those jobs because we haven't seen the significant decrease in um, income tax revenue that we would have expected from some of those losses. So I think. Um, We've uh, been able to replace some of those jobs with small businesses, I think, have increased in the city. And also with the uh, commitment that we've had by our um, our medical community in Saginaw with our um, three largest employers in the city, at least the two are, um, are the uh, two hospitals and then the VA hospital in the city is also a major employer for us. So um, They've been expanding and adding jobs and adding the medical school. And I know um, that city council and our city administration has um, done the best we can to work with uh, those organizations to promote that type of expansion too. Thank you for that breakdown. And uh, with that being said, um, those were all the questions that we had prepared for you guys today. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much for being here and participating in this. Uh, I sure learned a lot. Um, and I think that this session and hopefully many more in the future will be really valuable information uh, for residents and non-residents, anybody in the city of Saginaw to learn more about their local government. Um, I didn't learn a whole lot about the city of Saginaw government until I started to pay attention and educate myself. So um, it's nice to have a format like this where we can hear from you guys straight from the source, uh, the information we need to know. Kevin, and um, appreciate you and um, Councilman Bench uh, putting it together and um, also uh, the agenda with, uh, I think you had some really good topics on here. And like I said, I think, um, even if in the future when we can get back to in-person meetings taking this around to some of the association groups and if if you would uh, continue to be involved that would be i think a benefit for us and uh and i'm sure councilman bench and, and councilman uh, williams would be willing to participate as well and, and probably some of our other council members um in and uh move this throughout the community so more people can hear it and uh, learn about these things because I, I do think these are these are good topics and important and especially um, about how the departments work and how the water fund works. I think that's um, something that most people don't think about. So um, thanks for bringing these topics to us. Thank you. Parting comments, uh, Councilman Bench. Oh, just thank you uh, both to you and Amy and, of course, Reggie and uh, Cece as well, just for being willing to do this and take the time out of your busy days because everybody here was very busy. So um, we do appreciate it uh, very much. Mm -hmm.